So in your book, you have a entire chapter on vitamin D. So can you talk to us about why vitamin D is so important? Wow. Yeah. You know, I was, uh, uh, again, I was, I was sitting in my back porch on Guam watching the sunset over the Pacific Ocean, um, facing towards uh, the, 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 you know, Japan and, and other islands. Uh, and uh, I read this article in the lifestyle section about a Harvard physician who had done a meta-analysis on the level of vitamin D in the blood and the risk of cancer. And it blew me away when he said that the risk of developing cancer is higher amongst those with a low blood vitamin D level than it is for those who smoke cigarettes. And I remember, you know, I, I, I'm certified with two international agencies to help people stop smoking. And, and that was like, a, you know, a blasphemy. <laughs> I was like, well, wait a minute. How could just vitamin D levels be more important in terms of cancer mortality than whether you smoke or not. And, and so I checked that out closely and I discovered that the, the same statistics that were used to determine risk of smoking mortality was used in this case with vitamin D. So bottom line is this, at that very week, I started testing everybody uh, for their blood vitamin D levels. Now remember, I'm sitting on the island of Guam, right near the equator. I'm thinking, well, in Guam, nobody's going to have a vitamin D deficiency, not the sunshine vitamin. I mean, the sun shines every day of the year on Guam, right? And guess what? 80 to 90% of my patients were deficient in vitamin D. Okay? And, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that. One of them is age. We don't synthesize vitamin D out of cholesterol in our skin as we get older very effectively. Another reason is we're taking showers all the time. So what do you do when you're in the sun for an afternoon? You know, if you're out, if you're out, out, you know, exercising in the sun, first thing we do is jump in the shower, soak down, and guess what? Vitamin D down the drain because it's a fat soluble vitamin that's that's still not absorbed into the bloodstream. It takes up to 48 hours for that to fully absorb. And so, for a lot of reasons, we are deficient in vitamin D, especially in the winter time. For those who live above the 37th parallel. Uh, which is, you know, more than half of people in the United States, they, they, they get, even if they're in the sun all day long, they get zero vitamin D for five months of the winter. So, okay. so in other words, there is an, a, there's a powerful association with low vitamin D levels in the blood with both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. In fact, studies have shown that if, we, if, the, if children are vitamin D replete, 80 to 90 percent of type 1 diabetes would be eliminated. Big, big study in Finland. So th that speaks to autoimmunity in general, by the way. So, so I, I, I spent uh, seven years doing a gestational diabetes clinic every Wednesday morning when I was working in Guam. And, and there's, there's two things that I made sure that, that my patients were pregnant who had gestational diabetes or impaired glucose tolerance, not only that, that I make sure that they were exercising properly and eating properly, but I made sure that we optimize their vitamin D levels, number one, and number two, that we optimize their central fatty acid levels, okay? because those are the typical deficiencies found in most people, irrespective of their diet. So let's go back to what you said. You said there's a 70% there's a association between low vitamin D and type 1 diabetes, is that right? Actually, the, the, the studies initially said 90% uh, was, was preventable if, if, the, if there was at least 2,000 units of vitamin E per day consumed from birth on up through age 10. Um, but but if, you, if you crunch the numbers into a multivariate analysis, it's more like 80%. Okay, great. So <clears throat> two questions then for you. What is considered a low vitamin D status? If somebody were to go get a blood test, what is the number? What is the threshold by which they would say, okay, now I need to improve okay. this vitamin D? Most labs, go ahead, sorry. Okay, and then number two is if somebody's following a, a, a plant-based whole foods diet, is, are there any foods that they can eat that can actually boost their vitamin D status? Okay, so number one, shiitake mushrooms. <laughs> okay, uh, shiitake mushroom, if you eat like a, a steak, a shiitake mushroom steak, uh, you can get about 1,500 units of vitamin D uh, from that. Um, the, the, typically, the sources of vitamin D are not plant-based. They, they are 
like fish based or liver based, uh, uh, milk based. Uh, the, the, the dairy industry likes to push the fact that milk is, is fortified with vitamin D, but you would literally have to drink like four gallons of milk a day to get any substantial amount of vitamin D, clinically speaking. Of course, that would be a very, very, very bad idea. So I don't recommend dairy to anybody. Um, uh, and I don't certainly don't recommend liver to anybody <laughs> for all the toxins that liver carries. And, and I don't recommend fish to anybody because of all the toxins and, and, and other problems associated with that. So the, the, the answer is, is, uh, is, is in terms of labs, when you get your 25 hydroxy vitamin D measured, um, the, the lab t range typically is between 30 and 100 nanograms per milliliter. Okay, and so the, the, the key here is that at minimum, you want to be in what they call the normal range. And as you well know, normal ranges are a far cry from optimal range. Uh, a, you know, a normal range for cholesterol technically is 130 to 320. You don't want to have a normal cholesterol. You don't want to be anywhere near the, the upper half of a, of a normal cholesterol reference range. And so that's why, you know, some years ago, 20 years ago, they changed it from a normal reference range to a clinical reference range. Most labs, however, don't use a clinical reference range. They use a statistical reference range. And so that's why we, that my, my, the chapter in my book, Goodbye Diabetes, and the chapter in my book, Hello Healthy, I'll have like 40 pages on what the best labs are and not just the normals, but what's an optimal for that. Okay, and so bottom line is we want it above 50. So we got to get the vitamin D status above 50, and that's for all of us, regardless of any other factors. Now, one thing that uh, you see a lot on the internet uh, is that people say, okay, great. If I can eat shiitake mushrooms, great. That's a good source of vitamin D. However, there's a lot of people on the opposite side of things who say, no, 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 no. Plant vitamin D is vitamin D2. Right. Animal vitamin D is vitamin D3. Therefore, and the two of them have different biological functions. And so if I were to eat shiitake mushrooms and get the vitamin B D2, that doesn't have nearly the potency or effectiveness as vitamin D3 from animal foods. Is that a true statement or not? Well, you know, we're getting into technicalities now. I think here's the bottom line. Whether you get vitamin D2 or D3, you're going to improve your vitamin D status, period. Okay. And, and so now what's interesting is you can actually get a vitamin D3 that's vegan. I, I, I the number one vitamin I, I, I recommend to my patients for vitamin D is a vegan D3. And what, what happens that they take the ergocalciferol, the vitamin D2, and they just molecularly modify it to vitamin D3. So you have a, a natural D2 that has been modified into a bioidentical D3. So that's the one that I recommend so that we can technically get the best of both worlds. But what I don't recommend is taking a huge dose of D2 just once a week or once a month. That could be potentially a problem with people who have liver issues or other problems because now the body has to convert that massive dose of D2 into D3. It can do that. Most of the time it doesn't matter. But in some cases, it's just putting extra work on a system that's already tasked. 